many of you have been blessed with the enemy series? We're talking about the enemy in me, right? How to win the battles within. Because as Christians, we often uh, blame Satan many times for things that we are responsible for. It is true that Satan is a real enemy, but he's a defeated enemy. And we should not take him lightly, neither should we give him more credit than he deserves. Our victory is secure in Jesus Christ. We don't fight for victory. We're fighting from victory. Because Jesus Christ already conquered, then we are more than conquerors. Amen? And so what we have to do is guard our victory and guard and work out our salvation uh, wisely and make sure that the enemy does not come to make us stumble. And that's what this series is about. How often we are our own worst enemy. If you have not been here, I encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel. Uh, the, the sermons are there. And, uh, and let, me, let me preface this. Uh, next week, uh, we're, we're going to have a, a guest. And I, and I got to tell you, uh, I'm not going to tell you who that guest is because I would hate for you guys that are from the home church to come and show up on Sunday and not have a seat. And so we're not telling anybody who our guest is on Sunday because we want to make sure that you guys that are from the home church, that you get here, that you have a seat, and uh, it's going to be amazing. And then we're going to come back the following week and close out the enemy series, and it's going to be amazing. But I didn't want to forget that, so I just put, put pause on, on uh, what I was sharing. But uh, if you have not been here for this series, enemy, go back to our YouTube channel. Week one was for the angry people. Week two was for the stinking thinking people. Uh, week three was for the prideful people, and today I'm gonna pe I'm gonna speak to the offended people. <laughs> Amen. Raise your hand if you know someone who is easily, way too easily offended. Come on, raise your hand. Just look up here. Don't look sideways. Don't bump them with you because they're gonna, they're gonna get offended. All right. Don't look at them right now. Just raise your hand if you know somebody that gets too easily offended. The other day. I was, uh, it happens to all of us, right? The other day I was parking. It was a, it was a full parking lot. You've ever been in one of these showdowns with somebody that <laughs> you're both going for the same parking spot? Uh, and so I try to be smart when it comes to these, to these battles. And so what I'll do is I'll just kind of camp out in one of the aisles. And I'm like, it's only going to take a few minutes before somebody walks out of the mall or when somebody walks out of the store and has to, has to leave, right? And so I'll just kind of camp out in, in, in a little spot as long as nobody else is there. And, uh, and sure enough, I had this couple that was coming, this elderly couple, and, uh, you know, they, they did the thing with the remote, and so the, the lights flashed, and I knew what their car was, and so I, just, I was just camping out there. But lo and behold, there was another car that had been following them, all right? You know those, like, like stalker parking people that, <laughs> you know, you're walking and you can feel the car, like, you know, and you're like, man, leave me alone, right? And so they had been following uh, this couple since the moment they exited the store and so they come around they make the turn and I'm already there and I got my blinker on right because once you call blinker it's like that's it it's mine right I don't care who you are where you come from how long you've been following them I've been sitting here and it's my parking spot but they came forward right and they followed this elderly couple and um, so there we were the showdown and so in that moment, I had a decision to make. I could stick to my guns or I could be the friendly neighborhood Christian pastor that I am and, uh, and just let them go. And guess what I decided to do? Um, I decided to let them go. I said, you know what? It's fine. I let the couple go. And then I, you know, and I did the, the you know, universal uh, traffic language, you know, you know, just <laughs> go ahead, right? But then I got offended because I did the universal, I'm going to let you pass, and I didn't get the universal wave <laughs> or the tip of the hat or the nod, you know, something. But say thank you at least. Like, I've been sitting here for about 20 minutes. You ought to be thankful that I let you through. You could have at least given me a nod, a, 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 a wave. I, I mean, I could have left you there. You could still be stuck without a parking spot. If it were not for my grace and mercy and godliness, you could still be stuck without a parking spot. And uh, I was reminded how 
little things, petty things sometimes come to offend us. And truth is that we live in a hypersensitive culture where being a victim is considered heroic. Have you noticed that in our, in our day and age? Heroes are no longer heroes because of what they've done. It's because of what they've endured. And I'm not saying that, that, that they don't deserve credit for things that they've endured. But we've just become a culture that celebrates victimhood. And so that's why now people want to place a label on you. All right? I don't want to go too deep. But people want to place some sort of label on you. Because if they can define you, then they can suppress you. And if they can make you a victim, they can celebrate you. All the while, you are never overcoming. You are never triumphing. You're always being defined by somebody else's definition of how you fall into a category of victimhood. And that's the day and age that we live in today. We live in an age of perpetual offense. People get offended because somebody didn't text them back. You saw the little bubbles and they didn't text you back. How dare you? You started typing. I saw the bubbles and you didn't finish the text. Or, you know, nowadays it'll show you if it's read, right? It says you read it. It says that you saw it. It's happened to me as a pastor. And I'm like, man, I clicked it for one second and I uh, had something else to do. And it, it says there I read it, but I didn't really read it. That people get offended. People get offended because somebody didn't like their pic on social media. Like, I put it up for you. Well, you could have sent it direct. Like, why, why do you need to put it on a platform and then have me like it so that you can be happy? People get offended because your friends commented on somebody else's post, but they didn't comment on your post. People get offended because they come to church and somebody gave them this look. I don't know what this look is, but we always say that. They gave me this look. <laughs> they use this tone, and who knows what that means. Now, don't get me wrong. There are real injustices. There are real pains that you may be suffering from that you have endured. And I'm not here to undermine any of that reality. But my objective here today is to help you overcome offense to help you overcome offense because if you don't overcome this then bitterness and resentment are going to set in and you're going to jeopardize your own future you will imprison yourself you will isolate yourself that's what offense does to you it imprisons you it isolates you it cripples you it turns you into a victim that bottles up and 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 can never embrace the great future and the great things that God has predestined for your life I'm here to help you overcome it because personally I have never found myself saying man I'm having a much better day because I am bitter I've never said that. I've never found myself saying, you know what? Ever since I started holding grudges against my wife, our marriage has been amazing. <laughs> Ever since I embraced offense, I'm, I'm closer to God and I'm making a bigger difference in the world. That does not happen. Offense does, does the exact opposite to you. And one way the enemy traps a person is to keep the offense hidden. And when we hide the offense, that's rooted in what we talked about last week, pride. When we refuse to uncover the offense, we are covering it with pride because pride keeps you from admitting your true condition. Pride causes you to view yourself as a victim. And can I tell you, you may have been a real victim of some injustice, but your pride does not correct the offense that somebody committed against you. Two rights do not make, or two wrongs don't make a right. So if we buy into this victim mentality, then we will never live as victors. Anger, bitterness, grudges, resentment, all of these things will rob us of God's joy and God's purpose in our lives. And we won't be able to blame Satan because Satan would have just laid the bait, but we embraced offense and rejected victory and became victims and were satisfied to be, be viewed as victims. Today, for those of you who are note takers, I want to share five steps to escaping the victim mentality and overcoming offense. Five steps, biblical principles to escaping the victim mentality and overcoming offense. 
Number one, expect offenses to come. There's just something about expecting opposition that prepares you for it. We've been uh, hearing a lot about this coronavirus. And, and a lot of it's been because the media picked it up a long time ago. But now that the government health ag agencies and the president is talking about it, what they're trying to do is that they're trying to create a level of awareness, a level of expectation. Hey, in some way, in some form, it might come to affect you. It might hit your town. It might hit somebody you know. Now, they're not, the, the, the idea is not for you to run in a panic. It's not for you to bottle yourself up in a hole and never come out. That's not the idea. And many of us are reacting that way. The idea is when we create an expectation, then it allows us to be better prepared to combat, in this case, that virus. Are you with me? Now, can I, can I, can I say a side note here? How many of us can just decide to trust God and say, hey, listen, he is my healer. He is my portion. He is my defender. V that virus is a weapon and the, the word says no weapon formed against me will prosper. And I'm going to cover my children in prayer and I'm going to cover my church in prayer and I'm going to cover our schools in prayer and our community in prayer. I'm also going to be responsible. I'm going to wash my hands and I'm going to practice good hygiene and all of these things because one thing does not negate the other. We got to do both. We got to do with faith and works. All right. And so but, but at the end of the day, we're going to trust God that he is our healer and that he is our defender. And we're not going to go into a panic. Why? Because we don't fight alone. Jesus Christ has already died on the cross for all of our sins and for every sickness, including the coronavirus and whatever else thing may come our way. But there's something about when you're ready for something, when you expect it to come, it prepares you. Luke 17 verse 1, one day Jesus said to his disciples, there will always be temptations to sin. The King James Version narrows that phrase temptations to sin to offense. There will always be offenses. And it's fitting that the New Living Translation calls it a temptation to sin because that's the thing that offense does. Offense is always a temptation to fall into sin. Because being offended is not a sin, but being resentful is. Being bitter and dishing out poison and spewing out curses, all of those things are sinful. And so offenses are a temptation to sin. That phrase, temptation to sin, in the New Living Translation, or offense in the New King James, comes from the Greek, Greek word scandalon. Somebody say scandalon. That word scandalon is very... Uh, it, it's similar to our English word scandal, and it translates to offense. That's what the enemy wants to do in your life. Again, he cannot dominate you. He cannot overcome you, but he can use somebody to provoke an offense on your life that you become scandalized. You become so offended, and it becomes a trap. That word scandal on translates into offense, but it refers to the bait that you would put on a trap. You see, Jesus makes it very clear that you will find many of these traps in your daily walk. It is impossible to live in this world and not face opportunities to be offended. But offense is a bait. The enemy cannot trap you unless you bite the bait. Amen? How many of you have ever worked with traps, right? You have, you have a little ranch somewhere and, uh, and, and, and there's, uh, you have sheep or something and then there's these uh, either foxes or uh, coyotes and there's predators to your sheep and so you'll, you, or bobcats, you'll lay a trap, right? You'll lay a trap. Now, you don't literally trap the animal. You put bait in there and the animal traps himself. For taking the bait, that's the same thing. The enemy cannot, he does not have dominion over your life. He has no power, no authority, no permission from God to trap you. But if you take the bait, you trap yourself. That's a fitting image of what this whole series is about. So Jesus is preparing us. He's saying to his disciples, hey, expect offenses to come. Remember, he's talking to his disciples. So he's saying, hey, even when you're in the will of God, 
even if you're one of mine, you can be my disciple, you can be my child, still offenses will come. Can I tell you something, church? Offenses will come even in this church. Believe it or not. I know you think we're perfect, but we're not. Even in this church, some way, somehow, there will be opportunities for you to become offended. Even for those of you who serve, those of you who are volunteering, there will be opportunities to become offended. Some usher might not smile at you. Ushers, some lay person might just roll their eyes at you because they don't like where you're sitting them. <coughs> Leaders, let me just put this out there. The pastor, me, I might forget to thank you every once in a while. It happens. And you might become offended. Might as well be honest with you. Parking team, somebody might flip you the bird in the church parking lot. <laughs> Teachers, some parents will resent you for not being able to handle their kids. The same kids they can't handle at their own home. <laughs> and they're going to look at you with a stink face because you couldn't handle them at the church. You knew Full well, when you dropped them off, those little hellbound kids were going to cause a ruckus. You knew that. You knew they needed deliverance, amen? Even when you're walking in obedience, serving, volunteering in the will of God, tithing, being generous, being kind, full of the Spirit, even then offenses will come. Even if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, even if you've left everything behind to follow him, offenses will come. There's a rather uh, humorous, humorous story in the Old Testament. When I say humorous, I mean it, it's humorous to read it now. It probably was not humorous to have lived it out. But in the Old Testament, there was a king of the Ammonites named uh, King Nahash. Let me give you the background. King Nahash had been a loyal friend to King David of the Israelites. And so when King Nahash died, uh, David sent a delegation of his men to express sympathy and loyalty to the king's son, Naun. Naun was now going to take over uh, the kingship of his father. And so David sent a delegation of peace and condolences. But some of Anun's men, or Anun's men, there's, there's a discrepancy in how scholars translate it, but uh, I'll call it Anan. Anan's men sowed suspicion into the mind of this new king. Go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 3. The Ammonite commanders said to Anan, their master, do you really think these men are coming here to honor your father? No. David sent them to spy out the city so they can come in and conquer it. So check this out. They sowed suspicion into the mind of their king when this delegation remember they were just obeying king david's orders they were not doing anything wrong they didn't come with any ill intention they were in the will of their king carrying out the will of their master are you with me but the men in the in the ammonite camp sowed suspicion into the king's mind they've come as spies look at verse 4 so Hanan seized David's ambassadors and shaved off half of each man's beard and cut off their robes at the what? Buttocks. Yeah, it's in the Bible. Yes, it is. And he sent them back to David in shame. So let me explain, all right? It was very dishonorable for a Jewish man to have half of his beard shaved off. So can you imagine a Jewish man with just like half of his beard and the rest of it is, is, is shaved off? It was very humiliating for a Jewish man to have his beard shaved off because they considered it a sin to have it shaved off. So to have somebody else do it, it was a sign of humiliation. Now, it was, it was a shame for a Jewish man to have a, their beard shaved off. It was a shame for any man to have their pants cut off to the buttocks. All right? So can you imagine these mighty men of David and Daisy Duke cut off shorts? Don't make me illustrate, please, but just get the picture, all right? Um, they were being humiliated. Now, remember, they were being humiliated for carrying out the king's orders. They were not in disobedience. They were not in rebellion. They were obeying their king. 
But notice how David dealt with the offensive action. Look at 2 Samuel 10 verse 5. When David heard what had happened, he sent messengers to tell the men, stay at Jericho until your beards grow out and then come back. For they felt deep shame because of their appearance. So David is wise enough to say, hey, don't let these men come back into Jerusalem and to walk around town being embarrassed and everybody's going to look at them and everybody's going to laugh at them. Sent them to Jericho. Now the symbolism here is powerful because Jericho, the word Jericho means sweet fragrance. So in essence, the symbolism applies to us spiritually. David is saying whenever you're offended, whenever you've been shamed and humiliated, go to a sweet spot. Go to a sweet place. Go to a place of fragrance. Don't, you don't have to come. You're not going to be embarrassed. You're not going to be shamed. Everything's going to be okay once you spend some time in a sweet place don't get bitter don't get angry don't become resentful let your let your anger just die down and calm down don't seek vengeance everything is going to get better and I'm sure David said send them to Jericho the sweet place and we're going to get them a seamstress out there or we're going to give them uh, some some new clothes and and we're going to let their beards grow back out aren't you glad that we too have a king who does not want to see us shamed and embarrassed instead the Bible says Psalm 33 he is a shield around us he is our glory and the one who holds our head high and he will always provide a way out to any temptation to sin, including offense. Which brings me to point number two. Dwell in God's presence. Where's our sweet spot? Where's the fragrance that we need to overcome offense and shame and humiliation? It's in the presence of God. Somebody shout the presence of God. When you're offended, go to Jericho. Stay in the sweet place. Remain in God's presence. This story of David and how he protected his men from further humiliation reminds me of a New Testament parable that Jesus told. The story of the prodigal son. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the story of the prodigal son, let me summarize quickly. This man had two sons and the younger of the two went to his father and asked for his inheritance. Now there's a couple of things going on here that are very wrong. Number one, it was never the younger one that was assigned to ask for an inheritance. The executor of the will would always have been the firstborn. And the other thing that is wrong with what's going on in this parable is that in Jewish culture, to have asked for your inheritance before your father died was in essence saying, I wish you were dead. I want your money so bad that I wish you were dead. And so this younger brother goes to his dad and asks for his inheritance. He goes off to a distant land. The Bible says he wasted it all, all of the inheritance in, in wild living. He lost it all when a famine overtook the nation. He ended up feeding pigs and wanting their food. The Bible says he finally came to his senses. He repented and said, I'm going to return to my father's house. And uh, I'm sure his servants there are much better even than I am right now. And so I'm going to ask him, I don't need to be your son anymore. Maybe you have disowned me. But if you will make me at least one of your servants, I will come home. The Bible says that while he was still a long way off, the father ran to him. And this is a beautiful picture because it means the father would come out daily and look out into the horizon to see if his child was coming back. And when he finally saw that silhouette afar off, the father ran to him and covered his shame with an embrace. He hugged him and he called the servants and said, bring the finest robe that is in the house and put it on him and put a ring on his finger, a sign of possession, a sign of belonging and put sandals on his feet. In other words, you're going to start a new journey. And then Luke 15 verses 25 to 28 say this. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. So we've been talking about the younger brother. You thought I was going to talk about him. No, I'm going to talk about the older brother. Because a lot of us would, would, 
would probably fit the profile of the older brother much more than the younger brother because you're here on Sunday morning. You're not off while living uh, somewhere out in the distance. No, you are at church on Sunday morning. So while that's happening with the younger brother, the, the older brother says was in the fields working when he returned home. He heard music and dancing in the house and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. We could translate, the older brother was offended and wouldn't go in. Why was the older brother offended? Because he said, Dad, I never abandoned you. I never left you. I've always been faithful to you. I've been obeying you. I never abandoned the household of the faith. I'm not out living like my neighbor. I'm not out living like my brother. I'm not out living like those wicked people out in darkness. I've been faithful to you. And yet when one of these sinners comes, the church throws a party. Father, you celebrate them. How come you've never celebrated me this way? And he was offended. And I want you to notice two things about offense. Offense will make you barren and joyless. Barren and joyless. Infertile and joyless. Because the Bible says he had come in from the fields. He had been working. He had been producing. Now he should be able to come home and enjoy the fruit of his labor. But guess what? He can't enjoy it. So even though he's been working, he's been working for nothing. He's barren. Even though he's been working and everybody else is partying and it's his time to party, he can't enjoy it. Barrenness and joylessness is the curse of offense. Verse 31, his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. I want you to notice the response of the father. It's the voice of our heavenly father that speaks above the offense and he reminds us that we are his sons and his daughters, that he has chosen us as his own, that he is perfect and that he is good, that we are the children of a good, good father. And that as long as we remain in his presence and not take that presence for granted, then we are going to feel, feel the fullness of joy. We're going to partake of the fullness of the goodness of God. You see, the older brother's problem was that he had taken his father's presence for granted. He was, he was near the father, but he wasn't in the father's presence. He wasn't understanding. He wasn't enjoying the, the benefits of being under the covering of his father's presence. But now the father is offering the very same presence as the antidote for his offensive or for feeling offended. God's presence, church, is our Jericho. The Father's presence is our Jer Jericho, that sweet, fragrant place where we heal from offense. Here's, here's step number three, how to overcome offense. Remember the grace given to you. Remember the grace given to you. Whenever you are offended, remember all the times you've offended God and how God has withheld his wrath. And how God has bestowed upon you grace and mercy. Grace is when God gives you what you don't deserve. And mercy is when God withholds what you do deserve. And many times we've deserved to be, if, if people could read what has, what has passed our, through our minds and what has simmered in our hearts, we deserve to you know, be struck by lightning But God has withheld in his, in his mercy, has withheld his wrath and his punishment. There have been times where, where we have made bad decisions and we should suffer the consequences of our own bad decisions, but God has withheld the wrath of our own bad decisions out of his goodness and his grace. There are times where we have been undeserving of the blessings of God and God gives them to us anyway. Why? Because he is our father and we are his children. 
And so we need to remember that whenever we are offended. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is having a conversation with the disciples, teaching them how to deal with somebody that has offended you. How to reconcile with a person who has done you wrong. And Peter was that disciple that, he's that guy in the group that he will ask what everybody's thinking, but nobody dares to verbalize. That's Peter, right? And, and if you're a Peter in your circle of friends, you're always getting in trouble, right? Because you're always talking for somebody else, right? I'm just asking because somebody's saying this, or I'm just, I'm just saying because I, I heard the question. That Peter was that guy. He was always getting in trouble because he would dare ask what nobody else had the courage to do. Matthew 18, verse 21, Peter came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Now listen, Peter thinks he's being generous here because Jewish tradition said that you could forgive somebody up to three times. So Peter's like being holier than thou. He's saying, hey Jesus, I just, just for clarity, how many times do I need to forgive the same person that keeps offending me time and time again? Uh, I know Jewish tradition says three, but hey, I'll go on a limb I'll stretch it, and I'll forgive him even seven times. Is that enough? And look at Jesus' response. It says here, not seven times, verse 22, but 70 times seven. Now, if you already did the math, you're not good at forgiving. <laughs> you're like, oh, 490. Okay, all right. I, I can deal with that. That's not the point. Jesus was using hyperbole. He was using exaggeration to say, hey, don't keep account. You forgive as many times as you are offended. Are you with me? Now, sometimes we refuse to forgive because, uh, let me tell you, unforgiveness is like a cancer. It's kind of like a, like, a, like a tumor in, in your body. And... And you can go and pretend like everything's okay and you can smile, but we can still see it. You can't hide it. It's there. And a lot of people refuse to forgive because, because they say, if I forgive them, then they're just going to do it to me again. Right? Well, that should be your motivation to forgive them the first time because you're already carrying one thing over your, you're already carrying, oop, this illustration's not working, but you're already carrying one thing over your shoulder. Now you're going to be carrying two things if you don't let go of the first one. Are you with me? And it's just going to become a cancer that's going to keep growing and affecting you and hurting you and sabotaging everything that God has purposed for your life. And so sometimes you have to remember the times that God has forgiven you so that you can let go of the offense. It has been said that when you forgive somebody, you let a prisoner free. It's not the person that offended you. You let yourself free. Because often that person's off at Disneyland. They're, they're joyful, they're happy, and there you are tossing and turning in your bed at night. You can't get sleep, and you're bitter, and you're angry, and you're thinking of vengeance, and how, it's, how you're going to get back at them, and, you're, you, you know. and, and then you read the word, pray for your enemies. Yes, Lord, I pray he gets diarrhea. I, I, pray, I pray he gets... No! It's not how it works. So, so, so Jesus answers, verse 23, he says, Peter, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. Now listen, in ancient times, all citizens of a nation were subject to a king. So by using kingdom of heaven, Jesus is stating that this story applies to all citizens of heaven, all Christians, all the people in Vital Church on Sunday morning. This applies to us. Verse 24. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed, owned, I'm sorry, to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Now, it was impossible to pay it all. For him to say, I will pay it all, pay it all was ludicrous because some modern estimates put the debt of this servant at approximately $14.5 billion. That's what he owed. I will pay it all. Verse 27, then his master was filled with pity for him 
and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. Estimates put it at $4,000. $4, he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. So check this guy out. He has been forgiven a debt in the billions, and he cannot forgive a debt of 4000 his fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. So if you're feeling disgusted right now by the actions of this first debtor, debtor who could not pay billions and could not forgive 4,000, if, you, if you're feeling disgusted by his actions, that was Jesus' point. He wanted you to feel that disgust, and then he wanted you to understand what the story represents. That first debtor represents us. The king represents God. And what Jesus is trying to relay is, you have been forgiven so much more than what you have been offended by others. God has forgiven you far more things than the offenses that have come your way and that you now need to forgive because you got to give the same grace that you were given. The offenses that we hold against each other compared to our offenses against God are like $4,000 compared to $14.5 billion. What I'm trying to say, church, is this. Someone may have offended us, but that doesn't compare to the number of times we have offended God. Someone may have falsely accused us, but the stuff that is true about us is way worse than the lie they're telling about us. If they only knew the things that they don't know about us that are true, they don't even know the half of it. And so what they're saying about us falsely doesn't compare to the offense that we have carried out against God. We have offended the heart of God. And the grace that he gave me is the same grace I need to give others. Matthew 6, 14 to 15, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Step number four, cover offenses with love. This is what is known as giving others the benefit of the doubt. Because there's, you know, there's one of two people, you're, you're one of two categories of people in the world. You're either like the benefit of the doubt person or I believe the worst about you person. You're either an optimist or a pessimist. You're either positive or you're negative. Well, let me tell you something. The supreme ethic in Christianity is love. And there's a, there's a characteristic about love. Love always bends. Love is flexible. Love stretches. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. Love never gives up. How, how often does it give up? Never. It never loses faith. It is always hopeful. How often is it hopeful? Always. And endures through every circumstance. Through how many circumstances? Every circumstance. Love bends. Love bends. Proverbs 10 verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Let me tell you something about offenses. Every time that, that, that you have felt offended, I can guarantee this, almost every time it's because there's a gap between what you expected and what you experienced. That's how offenses happen. When the expectation that you had was not met, you experienced something different to what you expected. And so we get to choose what goes in that gap between what we expected and what we experienced. We pick. We choose the attitude, the assumptions that we're going to make. We choose what we're going to place in that gap. Let me give you an example. You expect your friend to show up on time, but he shows up an hour late. All right? At about the 30-minute mark, you start getting offended because he's not answering his phone calls. He's not texting you. 
He didn't let you know what's going on. You feel stood up about this time, right about now. So you had an expectation that he was going to pick you up at 6 o'clock, and it's 6.45, and he's still not driving up. So your expectation and your experience, there's a gap. Literally, a one-hour gap. You choose what goes in the middle. You can look at your watch and think the worst of him and say, oh, he's just irresponsible, lazy. He's probably asleep if I know him. He hibernates like a bear. Nothing can wake him up. He's always been lazy like that and irresponsible on top of that. Or you can say, you know what? He might have had an emergency. Maybe his car broke down. Maybe his, car, his phone battery died. And that's why he hasn't called me. You get to pick what goes in the middle while you wait for the explanation. Are you with me? And when I say cover offenses with love, when the Bible says cover offenses with love, it's saying, hey, always remain hopeful about that relationship, about that situation. Always, love always is hopeful. Endures through every circumstance. Never loses faith. It never gives up. Are you with me? Let me give you another example. You expect your husband to treat you with kindness when he gets home from work because you've missed him all day. And instead of experiencing kindness, you experience rudeness. So what you expected and what you experienced, there's a gap. You pick what goes in there. Now as the spouse, you can say, you know what? He's always been this way. This is probably how they taught him. That's probably he grew up. Salió igual al abuelo. Just like his dad or whatever. You can, you can, or you can say, you know what? My husband's probably having a bad day. My wife's probably having a bad day. Probably had a stressful day at work. And you can be sympathetic and you, become, you can be compassionate. And you can let things kind of die down. And then maybe talk to him, talk to her. And work things out. But you get to pick what goes in the middle. Either you can get offended or you can give the person the benefit of the doubt. One of the greatest lessons my mom always told me was, hey, always consider the source. Sometimes people will hurt you because they're hurt themselves. Sometimes people will try to make you bitter because it's an outflow of what they're experiencing themselves. A child is throwing a fit at a store. You get to pick. Your expectation is that kids should behave. Your experience is that often they do not behave. You can think, man, those parents sure are negligent. That kid, you know, is demon possessed. <laughs> he needs deliverance. Oh, but when it's your kid, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, friend. It's, it's, he didn't nap today. He didn't nap. That's why he's acting like this. It's the same thing, the kid, the same tantrum, but we hold ourselves to a different standard. Are you with me? Ephesians 4 verse 2, always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making, I love this, making allowance for each other's faults because of your what? Cover offenses with what? Love. Making allowance for other people's faults out of what? Love. When you cover offenses with love, let me tell you, this is the secret to becoming as unoffendable as possible. When you cover offenses with love, you'll become less offendable and more compassionate because oftentimes hurt people hurt people. While Job in the Old Testament was going through much suffering, he had lost his family, he had lost his home, he had lost his cattle, he had lost it all, he had boils all over his body, he was gravely ill. At off, uh, often during that time when he was debating with his friends, he would be offensive. His friends would take would, would, would take offense to some of the things that would come out of the mouth of Job. And his friends expressed their displeasure, dis, their displeasure at Job. And I love Job's answer on one occasion, Job ch chapter 6, verse 26. He says, do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches of a desperate one which are as wind? This is Job saying, hey, treat my words like the wind. Don't give them any weight. We say in Spanish, tirame a león. <laughs> They're coming from a man who is desperate and not thinking straight. Don't hold me accountable to the words that I said when I was desperate. When I was sick. When I was down and out for the count. Don't hold it against me. 
always be aware, church, that there is probably a brokenness or a pain in a person's life that may cause him or her to have broken patterns of communication with you. And what feels hurtful and offensive to you is probably more about their own hurt. It's probably more about what's wrong with them than what's wrong with you. And when you cover offenses with love, you become less offendable and more compassionate. And I'll close. Number five, rise above offenses. Rise above offenses. How do we do that? Look at Proverbs 19, verse 11. A person's wisdom yields patience. So be patient. And then it says this. This is powerful. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. When, when my wife and I left the church that we grew up in, where my dad was my pastor, he's, he's, he's my dad, he was my pastor, and, and he was my boss. And so he got to wear three different hats, and whatever hat was most convenient for him, in whatever moment, that's the hat he would use. So sometimes we would level as ministers, as, as colleagues, And when we would have a difference of opinion or a difference of interpretation of the scripture or what have it. And it was just that, a difference. It wasn't that one opinion was better than the other. It was just different. But then he would take off the pastor hat and say, well, I'm your dad. And you need to honor your dad. Right? And sometimes we'd have problems at, at, at the family level. And I'd be like, dad, you're wrong, dad. And he'd be like, well, I'm the man of God. So you need to respect me. And he would take off the dad hat and put on the pastor hat. And for, for a season in our lives, we, we went through uh, a, a lot of opportunities to become offended, my wife and I. I remember that because he was our dad, he felt the liberty to just kind of like, just be transparent from the pulpit. And he would talk about us and, and he would say what we did wrong and even in ministry and in church. And it was, it was rather humiliating. And it was an opportunity for us to get offended, but we knew, we knew that we had done nothing wrong, that we were trying to live out God's calling in our lives. When God calls us to plant Vital Church, we had a decision to make. We could leave our previous church with resentment. We could have left with, with pain. We could have even left with vengeance in our hearts and saying, you know what, I'm gonna plant my own church and I'm gonna invite your people because I pastored their kids. And their kids will follow me if I, if I call on them. And, I, and, and, and I could have, we could have set out to do much harm to that church. But we understood something. That something that starts bad will seldom end well. And that you reap what you sow. And so if we were going to sow division and if we were going to sow resentment and if we were going to sow bitterness... That's probably what we would have reaped. And we wouldn't be where we are today. In this awesome, amazing, beautiful congregation. I've always said, I think I pastor the best church in the country. And I mean that. I mean that. But, but let me tell you something. It, you, you have to be patient. And then it says here, it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. Sometimes you just have to let it go. And it's to your glory that you let it go. Because every time you forgive and cover an offense with love, it stimulates your spiritual maturity. You're becoming more like God. Do you know how many times God has to forgive us and let it go on a daily basis? So when you learn to master this, you're becoming more like God, literally. Let me illustrate something. In New Zealand, and I'm going to close with this. In New Zealand... Over 40% of birds are flightless. Over 40% of birds are flightless. And the reason is that throughout generations, the generations of these birds, of these species, they have lost their wings for one reason. In New Zealand, there are no ground living predators that present a danger to these birds. There's no snakes, there's no bobcats, there's no wolves, there's no foxes. And so 
the birds have no need to fly because there are no predators against them. And because they stopped flying throughout the generations, eventually the new species started being born without wings. They would just be born with, with, with stumps. Part of the evolutionary process of, this, of these particular species. And so through the generations, these birds have lost their wings because they had no need to fly. What am I trying to say? If you never face opposition, if you've never been offended, then there'd be no occasion to elevate and promote you. If you want to soar like an eagle and you want to spread your wings and fly, then by default, you will have to face offense and adversity. This is the same reason why in, when an airplane takes off, it always takes off against the wind. Why? Because it is the headwind. It is the wind that's coming in the opposite direction that actually gives the airplane its lift. And I'm here to tell you when I say rise above offenses, I'm here to tell you that everything that the enemy has intended for your destruction, God will turn around for your good. Offenses will come. Haters will come, the snakes will rear their ugly heads, but let me tell you, it is the headwinds, it is the opposition, it is the adversity that allows me to build fortitude and spread my wings and be lifted up and rise above the offense. Offense and adversity will make you lift your eyes to the mountains where your help comes from. Your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Offense and opposition will make you lift a shout unto heaven. It will lift your prayer life. It will lift your heart. It will lift the song of praise through the storm. It will lift you into the hands of the Father. It is to a man's glory to overlook an offense. And the calling ahead of me is much greater than the offense behind me. My life is too short and my calling and my anointing is too big to be held captive by offense. So today I decide to forgive and let go and let the offense lift me. I'm going to rise above it and I'm going to overcome. If you agree with me, I want you to shout amen. Come on. Stand with me this morning. I feel the presence of God here. I feel this is a morning of deliverance. A morning of freedom. Some of you need to let go. As real as that pain was, as real as the injustice was. I'm reminded of Joseph, the dreamer. His brothers threw him in a pit. And 20 years later when he's reigning over Egypt and his brothers come begging for food, he could have thrown them in a pit. He could have been vengeful. The Bible says that when they threw Joseph in the pit, Joseph was looking at, up at them, crying out for mercy. Please don't do this to me. They sold him off into slavery. But as God would have it, he turned it around for good. And Joseph is reigning over the richest country in the world. His brothers come in begging for food. He could, for food. He could have gotten revenge and he could have thrown them in a pit. But let me tell you, Joseph realized something. That sometimes your own healing is going to come when you give today what they didn't give you yesterday. He couldn't turn back the clock. And his brothers couldn't make up for what they did. But Joseph could use the opportunity at hand to give the grace that he had never been given. And the Bible says that when he, when he forgave them, his shouts, his screams were heard even to Pharaoh's palace. Can you imagine how, how much how much bitterness was being let go? Can you imagine how much pain was being set free? Can you imagine how much weight he was putting off of his shoulders? He was screaming that they could hear it across the street in another building. Because oftentimes your own healing is going to come when you give the grace that somebody else should have given you. They never should have abused you when you were a defenseless child. They never should have bullied you. They never should have taken advantage of you. Those of you who have been victims of a, of a financial scam. Yes, there are evil people in this world and that, that should have never happened. But listen, your healing is going to come when you give to others what your offenders didn't give to you. And as you become the best father to your children, you'll be able to heal from the pain 
of being a fatherless son or having a violent father yourself. When you become the best wife that you can be to your husband or the best husband you can be to your wife, you're going to heal from, the, from your, your parents' split. And that hurt from their divorce is going to be healed as you give your children a different experience as you give to them what you were never given. I believe that. I believe that this morning. And I believe that God wants to set you free from offense. That you would be set free to embrace everything that God, all the glory, all the goodness, all the blessings, all the promises that God has predestined for your life. It is to a man's glory to overlook an offense. Thank you for watching our Vital Church YouTube channel. If anything in this message has prompted your heart to open up to Jesus Christ and make him the Lord and Savior of your life, repeat this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life and my heart to you. I repent of my sins and I pray for forgiveness. As of this day, I confess you my Lord and Savior. I want to live for you the rest of my days. For salvation, I give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you made that prayer, welcome to the family of Christ. And if this message has been a blessing to your life, don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notification button so that you can continue to watch all of our video content. Also, pass the blessing forward by sharing this link with family and friends. Thanks again for watching. God bless you.